one is. You know, it used to be one. It used to be one here, but I don't know where it is. Somebody has taken, it's, it's a tall chair and it's not here. You remember the tall chair? Somebody has taken it out. I won't tell you, city manager. You know, we always have an answer. <laughs> no, that's between <laughs> us. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Mayor. Hey, how you doing? I started walking downstairs. I'm like, I'm going to start from here on out. Is Jean here? Is Jean here? Her And is this on? Yeah, it's on. Okay, okay. <laughs> Good evening. Could we have your attention, please? We like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order at 7 o'clock p.m. Monday, 2nd of March. And I'd like to welcome all of you that are with us this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. <clears throat> Thank you. I ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge. <laughs> All rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. Here. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Here. The Mayor Pro Tem will be late. She's at the uh, yes. service. Uh, we are have a little bit different setting, but I'm going to ask if we have two proclamations to present. Uh, Alexander Johnson, Urban Farsi, manager. If you will join me, and I'm going to see where we can join. I guess down there. Mr. Mayor, while you're getting ready for that, I'll, I'll just note that um, there have been people recently who have told me that we should change Alex's title to the city Lorax. So. <laughs> That's actually high Since praise, I think. It is high praise. Since Dr. 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 Seuss's has a new birthday. Book coming out right. too in August. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's the same. Okay. Uh, this this recognizes Arbor Day, 
and it speaks to the fact that Arbor Day is officially recognized as an annual ob observance by the state of North Carolina, whereas trees provide numerous environmental benefits to the Durham community by lending summer shade, buffering winds, moderating year-round temperatures, reducing glare, filtering the air of pollutants, absorbing noises, diminishing erosion by retaining soils, and reducing runoff, building soils, providing habitat and food for wildlife, reducing energy consumption, and absorbing carbon dioxide. Whereas trees beautify the city, enhance the value of property, and provide pleasant surroundings for residents and for new and existing businesses. Whereas planting and caring for trees is a living testimony of Durham's commitment to the health and welfare of present and future generations. Whereas involving the community in expanding and caring for Durham's trees is included in the city's strategic plan. Uh, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim March the 14th, 2015, as Arbor Day mm -hmm. in the City of Durham, and encourage and call upon the residents of Durham to observe this day in recognition of the value and benefits which trees provide and to promote the planting and care of trees within the City of Durham. Witness my hand, Corporate Social City of Durham, North Carolina, this the second day of March, 2015. And I'm going to present this to Alexander Johnson, along with your other titles and, <laughs> and comments you might have heard. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Bell and members of Durham City Council, and thank you, Mayor Bell, for issuing the proclamation. I'd like to invite our Arbor Day partners to stand with me as we accept this pro proclamation. We have Joel Reitzer with the City's General Services Department, um, Tony Dotlick with Keep Durham Beautiful, and Tobin Freed from the City and County Sustainability Office. This year marks 32 years that the city of Durham has been recognized by the National Arbor Day Foundation as a Tree City USA. It is a significant accomplishment and one that shows how the city has valued our trees as greens and green space for decades. Being recognized as a Tree City USA means that for 32 years, our city has had an observance of Arbor Day complete with a mayoral proclamation an urban forestry program that's supported with a minimum of $2 per capita and a tree ordinance. Our city plans to observe Arbor Day on Saturday, March 14th from 1 to 3 p.m. with a community tree planting and a tree seedling giveaway. I'd like to invite all of you to attend the event and to help plant over 100 trees within the Old West Durham neighborhood. Uh, volunteers should meet at the Greystone Baptist Church parking lot at 2601 Hillsborough Road. There will be a tree planting demonstration, and then we'll divide into groups to plant trees that are sponsored by the Old West Durham Neighborhood Association, Keep Durham Beautiful, the City of Durham, with tools and gloves provided to volunteers. In addition to planting trees, we'll be giving away free tree seedlings to Durham residents. Attendees will be able to choose from 11 varieties of seedlings and receive guidance on tree selection and planting from Durham County Master Gardener volunteers. Tree seedlings are being provided by the City County Sustainability Office and Keep Durham Beautiful. The Arbor Day event is made possible through a strong collaboration with Durham Neighborhoods, the Department of General Services, and our partners in the City County Sustainability Office, Keep Durham Beautiful, and the many members of Trees Across Durham. This tree planting will make a real difference. We appreciate that our residents frequently volunteer to join us in community tree plantings, which bring neighbors together for a common goal. Improving the appearance of key Durham streets, such as Main Street, and incorporating green infrastructure into our rights of way also ultimately supports the city's strategic plan for a thriving, livable neighborhood community. Tree plantings like this are happening throughout neighborhoods in Durham this season and help build a community that enjoys the many benefits that a healthy urban tree canopy provides. Please join us in celebrating Arbor Day this year. Thank you. Ms. Constance McClary, present. How are you doing? Uh, this proclamation <coughs> recognizes multiple sclerosis, and Ms. McClary is the service manager of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society for the Greater Carolinas Chapter. Uh, it speaks to the fact that MS is a neurological disease of the central nervous system 
affecting 2.3 million people worldwide. And each hour, someone is very newly diagnosed, according to research by the National MS Society. Whereas the National MS Society, Greater Carolina's chapter, reports that in our state, more than 13,000 people are diagnosed with MS, and the disease generally strikes people in the prime of life between ages 20 through 50 and causes unpredictable effects in which the progression, severity, specific symptoms cannot be foreseen. And the cause and cure for this often debilitating disease remain unknown, according to the research by the National MS Society. Whereas the National MS Society at Greater Carolina's chapter is committed to a world free of MS, heightening public knowledge about and insight into the disease, whereas since 1946, the National MS Society has been a driving force of MS research and relentlessly pursuing prevention, treatment, and a cure, and has invested more than $868 million in groundbreaking research, according to the research by the National MS Society, whereas funds raised through the National MS Society fuel the efforts of nearly 380 research projects globally totaling $50.6 million annually at the best medical centers and universities and other institutions throughout the United States and abroad. Because of this, MS research has never been more helpful than it is today. Whereas discovering the cause, finding a cure, and preventing future generations from being diagnosed with MS is an important task that all Americans and North Carolinians should support. Whereas the city of Durham, North Carolina, recognizes the importance of finding the cause and cure of MS a chronic and often devastating disease, and expresses this appreciation and admiration for the dedication that the National MS Society Greater Carolina's chapter has shown towards a future free of MS. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim March the 2nd through March the 8th, 2015, as MS Awareness Week, and request all citizens to take note of this observance by encouraging others to learn more about the MS and what they can do to support individuals with MS and their families. Witness my hand in Corporal Silver City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the second day of March, 2015, and I'm going to present this to Ms. McClary for any comments that she may have. That's it. <laughs> she, she said I said it all. She, what she said is I, I said what she gave me to read. That's, <laughs> that's important. Let me ask for their comments by members of the council. Councilman Moffitt. Yes. <clears throat> I wanted to echo what the city manager said on Friday at our budget retreat, just the appreciation that was said in, um, with a lot of folks there, but not really with the public, just the appreciation for all the work that, the, um, that so many of our city staff are doing and have been doing over the last two weeks uh, to keep the city um, up and running. So part of that was... Alex Johnson, who just left the City Forestry Department, you can drive around and see how much work mm -hmm. they have left to do in public works and the police and the fire and, and um, everybody else that's out there and doing the hard work. So, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Any other comments about the council? <coughs> Councilwoman Katari. Just to let people know that in the back of the room, m many staff are going to be leaving in the next five minutes, so just bear with us. You'll have more space. And I probably should announce why we're here, but I assume everybody knows that there's renovation work going on in the, in the city council chambers, and for that reason, we are holding our meetings here. I uh, will recognize the city manager for any priority items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for a priority item this evening, if I could take just a few minutes uh, following up on Councilmember Moffitt's comments to uh, give a uh, brief recap of uh, where we are with the uh, snowstorm recovery right. take me just, just a few minutes I know the public affairs staff has some uh, uh, clips of some pictures and some videos that uh, they wanted to uh, show as well but certainly as we know uh, beginning last uh, Wednesday evening through Thursday morning uh, we experienced uh, between uh, four inches of snow in southern Durham all the way to eight inches of snow up in uh, the northern parts of the city uh, which for us is certainly quite a bit, and that led to a number of power outages, uh, significant uh, uh, poor road conditions, uh, school closures, what have you. Um, yeah, beginning uh, really before the storm even began, uh, uh, the City of Durham employees uh, were out in full force to uh, do everything they could to try to make the uh, roads uh, prepared to be uh, 
uh, ready for snow removal and uh, uh, during the event providing rescue uh, services for stranded motorists. Uh, we had uh, folks uh, uh, online keeping the uh, ready to keep all the vehicles uh, up and running. We had over 30 vehicles that uh, were pre-storm uh, uh, working in 12-hour shifts, uh, spreading uh, over 1,100 tons of salt and 22,000 gallons of, uh, of brine mix to, uh, to prepare. But then, uh, as we know, once the, uh, the storm hit, uh, that uh, engaged our folks to work uh, continuously in 12-hour shifts to uh, uh, do snow removal. The, uh, the vehicle maintenance crews were working uh, overnight to <coughs> ensure the all of the equipment uh, was was able. Uh, you may have even seen on, uh, I believe it was on Thursday evenings, uh, uh, CBS Evening News. We uh, we were part of the story, and uh, some of our uh, one of our employees in particular uh, was was interviewed uh, uh, by one of the uh, the national reporters that uh, we were all very very proud of. It's indicated the uh, you know the fleet management uh, did quite a bit of work. Uh, fire crews are out uh, rescuing. Uh, uh, responding to emergencies, but also uh, rescuing stranded motorists as well. Uh, of course, the Durham Police Department uh, doing doing much the same. Had a few uh, statistics. We had over a thousand calls for assistance during the uh, storm event. Uh, we responded to uh, police responded to a total of 37 accidents. Uh, initially, on that was on on Thursday. Friday, there was an additional eight accidents. Uh, we had uh, some accidents with injuries, but uh, but nothing too too serious. Uh, we agreed that uh, most everybody took the uh, the heat and uh, and stayed home, but we did have a few folks who ventured out and entered into some unfortunate situations. Uh, general Services Department, as Councilman from Office said, uh, was out in full force, responding to uh, uh, dozens and dozens of uh, is uh, issues just like this with uh, trees across roadways. Uh, we are still fielding quite a few calls um, for uh, storm debris remo removal and some issues with uh, trees in, in or near roads. So we'll be working on that uh, over the next uh, several days. Of course, the Solid Waste Department ended up with, uh, with lots of challenges because this was really a kind of a two-week event for them. The prior week, they had had a difficult time getting uh, all of their collections done. Uh, but I am very, very proud and pleased to report that uh, by the end of Saturday afternoon, they had uh, completed all of the routes for the two-week period, with the exception of yard waste. And I thought that was a very remarkable and uh, uh, well-deserved thank you to uh, to those folks for uh, all that uh, they were able to do to uh, to get us caught up. So, just want to you know quickly again say, following Councilmember Moffitt, that how much I appreciate the work of all of our employees who uh, who are you know work tire tirelessly when the when the storm, you know, is on the horizon, they've got the thing, you know, the, the wheels are well oiled, believe me. It, does, it takes very little uh, on my part, uh, and uh, the staff just knows what to do, gets it done, and they just do a terrific job. So I wanted to say thank you and document that for the record. So if you had any okay. questions, we do have some staff here that will be glad to answer any other questions you have. <laughs> questions? Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Recognize the city attorney for any priority times? Oh, I, I really can't compete with that priority <laughs> item, so I, I have no priority <laughs> items. What were you doing during uh, the storm? Is what we were the doing. lawyers were, were heeding the advice of the manager and staying home. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we'll proceed with the uh, agenda. Priority items come first. If I item is removed either by the public or the council. We'll discuss that later. I'll read the head of each one of the consent agenda items. Starting with the approval of <coughs> item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, citizens advisory committee appointments. Item three, Durham Board of Adjustment appointment. Item four, interlocal agreement between the city of Durham and the city of Raleigh for the community. V's scenario planning initiative. Item five is interlocal agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation in the city of Raleigh for the regional freight plan. Item six is contract with Parsons Brickenhoff for the development of the regional freight plan. 
Item 7 is Frontier Telephone Settlement, and I'll pull that item. <coughs> item 8 is FY 2014-2015 Second Quarter Financial Report. Item 9 is the bid report for January 2015. Item 10 is proposed sale of mission placed by upset bid parcel ID 110-153 City Track 2286. Item 11 is sale of property between the City of Durham and the North Carolina Department of Transportation for the pedestrian enhancement project located at 4702 Old Chapel Hill Road, parcel ID 140067, City Track 1911. Item 12 is lease of a portion of Duke Park, parcel 109272, to the Durham Bicycle Cooperative. Item 13 is proposed conveyance of various property interests to the North Carolina Department of Transportation for Austin Avenue widening project. Item 14 is construction manager risk contract with Lend Lease U.S. Construction Inc. for the police headquarters complex, complex and I'll pull that item. Sure. Item 15 is architect architect contract with O'Brien Atkins and Associates PA for the police headquarters complex project, and I'll pull that item. Item 16 is contract with Morris and McDaniel Inc. for promotional testing and assessment services. <coughs> <coughs> 17 is the North Carolina Institute of Minority Economic Development Construction Inspections Contract Amendment. Item 18 is utility relocation for North Carolina Department of Transportation, Austin Avenue Bridge number 93 replacement. Item 19 is a contract amendment for ST257 Carver Street extension. Item 20 is North Carolina Department of Transportation construction agreement to repave Guest Road. Item 23 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Item 25 through 26 items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. I entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda with the exception of items 7, 14, and 15. So second. 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 So improperly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, they kept us saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. We move to the general business agenda. Item 23. Mr. Can we ask any staff that uh, can leave to please go ahead and leave and uh, otherwise uh, maybe move from your seats and go into the uh, conference room and then we'll get you back in here as need be. Thank you. While they're leaving, I, t for, I think there's uh, some students here. For what's just happened is we just approved a whole bunch of the agenda, so <laughs> most of it's done. But we have the public hearings and three three other items. So we'll need to have everybody try to find a seat or move away from that door just to be sure that we can uh, have access in case of fire. There are some seats up front, so please, if you can find a seat, we appreciate you taking the seat. Over here on the side, there's some seats over here as well. There's a few more seats, please. Over, over here, there's a few more seats. We just really need you to move away from the back door back there. Okay, we're going to have the uh, 2014 annual police crime report uh, by Police Chief Jose Lopez. Yes, Jose Lopez, Chief of Police, City of Durham. Have a 2014 uh, crime report. <clears throat> the police department's quality report covers the department's six performance measures as listed. The report also includes additional statistics and information about significant accomplishments and highlights. Part 1 violent crime was up by 15% in 2014 compared to 2013. This was driven by an increase in aggravated assaults and robberies. Violent crime accounted for 15% of Part 1 crime in 2014. The rise in violent crime was caused in large part by a significant increase in the number of aggravated assaults. We noticed that there was an increase in the number of shooting into occupied houses and vehicles, and in many cases there were multiple potential victims. 
Our aggravated assault statistics are calculated by the number of victims, not by the number of incidents. We've continued to focus on aggravated assaults by gathering intelligence, conducting targeted patrols, and working with the community. Our robberies were up in 2014 after hitting a 23-year low the year before. During 2014, we made several arrests of people charged with multiple robberies. Property crime was up 2% in 2014. The number of reported motor vehicle thefts was the lowest in 15 years. <coughs> During 2014, we continued our residential awareness program known as RAP, which focuses on residential burglaries. 87% of the burglaries in 2014 were to residences, and 18% of the burglaries did not involve forced entry. During 2014, we identified businesses with large numbers of shoplifting reports, met with the managers, and discussed ways to reduce these incidents. We have investigators who share information about business larcenies with other area law enforcement agencies to help us identify trends and suspects. <coughs> Our clearance rates for 2014 were above the FBI national average for cities our size in all categories except aggravated assault and overall violent crime. Our clearance rates improved in all property crime categories in 2014. This slide shows the part one crime and property crime rates per 100,000 since the year 2000. The violent crime rate dropped 22 percent in that time and the property crime rate is down by 41 percent. We were unable to meet our targets of responding to 57% of priority one calls in under five minutes. We also were unable to meet our 5.8 minute average response time target that we have set. Our sworn positions were 99% staffed at the end of 2014. The positions are now fully staffed since we started an academy in February 2015. There are currently 28 Durham police recruits in that academy. Our non-sworn positions were 90% staffed at the end of 2014. These positions are currently 94% staffed with seven vacancies. I'm very proud of the work my employees do with the community. This is particularly evident during the 2014 holiday season when Durham Police Department employees reached out in many ways, including adopting families for Christmas, providing Thanksgiving and Christmas meals, and making donations to various organizations. In the next few slides, you will see some examples of their work in the community. And you can also read about many other Durham Police Department community activities in your report. In one holiday initiative, District 3 investigators partnered with Walmart on Hope New Hope Commons Drive to provide gifts for 27 children and 15 families. 180 toys were collected through a Toys for Tot Challenge sponsored by the Forensic Science Division and District 5 staff. The challenge was also supported by contributions from Police Headquarters staff, District 1 substation staff, and Vega Metals, which is located near the downtown substation. Officers of the Great Unit, the Gang, Resistance, and Education and Training, donated $300 to the Volunteer Center of Greater Durham's holiday outreach efforts. Officers from Squad 4C distributed winter care packages to the homeless. The packages included hats, gloves, and other items as well as information about programs offering assistance. Investigators from District 1's Criminal Investigation Division made a donation to Duke University Hospital's Cancer Unit. The donation was used to meet the needs of patients and to help cover some holiday expenses. The Downtown Bike Unit 30 served meals to more than 200 people at the Durham Rescue Mission in December. They also gathered toys and canned food to donate to the mission. These are just a few of the many holiday initiatives conducted by our employees. Thank you. Thank you for the questions recognized. Councilman Shule, Councilman Cotardi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, I have some questions and also had some comments I wanted to make um, that this spurred me to think about relative to the budget presentation the other day, just mm -hmm. maybe food for thought. Um, First thing I wanted to do, though, was I, I just came from a board meeting of the Durham Housing Authority. And uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, they were very appreciative of the extra officers that you all have put into a couple of their housing communities recently. And they feel that it has been really beneficial. And uh, have, they've been, they were, they, a whole board 
uh, was expressing appreciation and the staff. So I just wanted to not only pass it on to you, but to tell the public that. So thank you. Um, so I have some questions. Um, one of them is about the aggravated assaults, and I wonder uh, if you could talk a little bit about the, the how you what strategy you could employ to get a handle on these and uh, it's really the one category that is driving the increase and so I wondered if you had any thoughts to offer on that. Yeah, we, we noticed the same pattern starting in January, uh, late December, January, reference to uh, shooting into occupied and non-occupied dwellings, also shooting at motor vehicles and, uh, and we started to uh, pin down our data to find out where it was occurring. We noticed some areas where it was occurring quite a bit. Uh, we've taken various of our specialized units and uh, redeployed them in an operational setting in those targeted areas, and we've been uh, going out and addressing the, uh, the issue of the shootings. Now, we also went into these neighborhoods with uh, people from the community. We went with uh, PAC members. We went with our uh, Faith Initiatives uh, clergy and uh, police officers, and to some of these neighborhoods, we went door to door and uh, let the community know what was going on, first of all, in their community as far as the shootings, uh, asked for any information that they may have, gave them information relative to uh, crime prevention and how to get information to us, and, uh, and let them know the purpose of, uh, of the enforcement action that was going to be occurring and the uh, larger number of police presence that they were going to be seeing. And uh, to, uh, I have to, to say that so far, it's been uh, paying out in, uh, very well for us. Uh, we've had a reduced amount of shootings, uh, not a total elim elimination, but an extreme reduction right. in the shootings. And then that's how we're going to be moving forward. So we're looking at other neighborhoods that we want to go in with the community and let the people in the community know that we're not, the police aren't there just because we want to be there. We're there because uh, there's a, the violence in that community is, is calling us. And, uh, but the weather, of course, has made that almost impossible. And when the weather gets better, we're going to be back to doing that, and which is one of the, uh, uh, the ways in which we're addressing some of this violence is going out into community and letting them know that we're going to be there and that there may be issues relative to police presence. I think it's great you're doing that, and I, I'm appreciative of the fact that, that you feel that you're, <coughs> that you're improving the situation. Thank you. Um, there's a chart on page 11 of police recruits. It has two columns on the right. One is Durham residents total and the other is Durham residents. I wasn't sure what the difference between those two columns were, but just uh, I'd like to know that at some future time. But which, which, uh, on that slide 11, you're looking at the, uh, at the report? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I don't I'm have sorry, a copy page of that with me, report. but yeah, I can get back to you in reference yeah, to Yeah, sure. Here, here's the thing about the chart that uh, there was a lot of good things in this report, and one of the, the disappointing things, though, is that when we're, we're successfully recruiting more minorities and more Durham residents into the force or into, the, into trying to apply for the force, you all are making progress there. You can see by those numbers in terms of getting people to apply, uh, six out of the 14 African-American males did not pass the written test. So here's my question. Um, do applicants who fail the written test find out what their deficiencies were? If they were close to passing, can they work on these deficiencies and come back and take the test again? And how long do they have to wait? I, I'd I, have to I, get I'm back. concerned that we, yeah. I'd have to get back to you because I think yeah. that uh, we're careful about what we tell them, reference to the test. Sure. We don't want to have someone have an advantage sure. because uh, of the test. But mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I'm doing is speaking to different uh, members of our community, community groups, and asking them to to take people on board with their, with their groups and organizations and prepare them to become police officers and prepare them because, uh, I mean, there's but so much that we as a police organization can do, but I think there are many individuals or many groups uh, in our community that can help us as far as diversity is concerned and making sure that people within their communities, and uh, there are quite a few of them out there, so they can get them ready to become uh, police officers so we can have more Asians, more Hispanics, more African Americans, uh, I mean, all. Great. I just think of this, you know, I could, I know how we have a lot of organizations in town that do tutoring. You know, I think about, for example, what the Achievement Academy of Durham does uh, with uh, GED candidates and other people who are, who are striving to achieve educationally. 
if we have a person who is otherwise well qualified or we feel uh, but is close on the written test, I wonder if we shouldn't think about that as some way to help get them over and above. So I just want to offer that as a, something to think about. And we allow them to come back and retest after a certain period of time. Yeah. But uh, I would, uh, you know, I would love to have an agency contact me and say we'd like to identify individuals in this community that we want to prepare for your uh, police academy. And not just in the written, but also in the exercise mode, because I, mm -hmm. I think we're getting beaten out by Burger King and, uh, and McDonald's. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, making yeah. it difficult to get through our uh, yeah. entrance exams. Yeah. I, w yeah, I was thinking the African-American males in particular, though they were passing the physical test, but some of them were having trouble with it written. But anyway, I appreciate your comments. Um, it, I appreciate you're getting the fair and impartial policing off the ground so strongly. It looks like you've got a good schedule set up for the training of the first cadre of frontline officers. And I was wondering how it's been received so far by those who have, who have had the training. Uh, I've yet to have anybody with give me any negative feedback relative to it. Many of them walk into it, you know, being a little uh, suspect because of past, uh, but then when they go through it, they realize that it is a totally different type of, of training. When we're talking about diversity training, we're talking about how we think versus how we should think, and uh, which is, I think, what's important. We need to accept the way we feel and the way we think and look at things and then deal with it at that aspect relative to learning how to think about something. And when officers come out, have they had a positive response? Yes, they have. They, all that I've spoken to have had a, a positive response relative right. to it. Great. I also want to thanks for, for your, for thank you and uh, the whole department, especially those of you all uh, from, from the top for your support of the misdemeanor diversion program. Um, and I th the support that you all are giving is evident and it's important. My question on this is, how are we training our frontline officers for the uh, to figure out when someone should be referred to the misdemeanor diversion program? That training started way before the misdemeanor program went into effect, uh, as and we've brought in individuals who are part of the program to teach our officers also and teach our supervisors. Uh, we've uh, written down some some training for them to memorandums. Uh, we've let them know how the program works, and then we've also brought them in and, and just gave them uh, roll call <coughs> training. And they also have the availability of speaking to a supervisor mm -hmm. uh, at any point in time if they have any questions or concerns about it. And uh, on, their, on the police site, uh, they can garner whatever information they need. But quite clearly, I think they're getting the message at this point in time. Good. And, so the, um, so the, the training is uh, the, 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 all your frontline officers are being touched by this training correct. in person in some way? Yes. And also investigators, too, because right. they wind up uh, engaging uh, you know, individuals who could go into yeah. this program. I know the program is new, but it's, as it goes on, I would love to know how many referrals the department is making uh, as it goes ahead. Um, I also am impressed with the call-in program for the minor offenders in the drug market intervention operation. Uh, and it said you had nine people in that call-in program. I guess it's been going for a few months. I wondered if you had any idea how that was going so far. Is it working? The, the current one, I don't know. I know that in the past we've had individuals who've gone through the program and have done well. Uh, whether it's working or not, it all depends on what your number is satisfactory yeah. for you. It's a very difficult program. It costs a lot of money mm -hmm. and a lot of time to do, and we have to mm -hmm. put a lot of resources in it. Mm -hmm. So we constantly have to reevaluate uh, how we're going to continue with it. It's also sad to, uh, to realize that it's difficult to identify individuals who would qualify for that program mm -hmm. that we encounter yeah. because mm -hmm. they'll, they'll have so many arrests or so many other issues yeah. that won't allow them to qualify for the program. But we, we do keep moving and looking for different ways, mm -hmm. uh, not only uh, within our ranks, but also looking outside of the city to see what other police departments are doing and uh, possibly adapting what they're doing in order for it to work for us. Well, that seemed really innovative. And again, I'd love to hear how that goes once you've kind of got a feel for it. Thank you. Uh, I also want to congratulate you on the CIT program and training where you all continue to be, I think, doing a whole lot. Uh, and I noticed there were 3,548 calls for service with a mental health component. I wondered if you had an estimate of the number or the percentage of those 3,500 which are responded to by someone with CIT training. In other words, is it, is it most of those calls with a mental health component that someone who has CIT training responds to, or is it only a small portion of those calls? 
I think that uh, when someone, when it's identified <coughs> that there's a mental health issue, mm -hmm. officers are dispatched who are C CIT qualified. Mm -hmm. In many cases, officers who are not, which are very few, who are not CIT certified, when they encounter such an issue, you'll hear them calling out for someone from CIT. And we also, uh, when we encounter people with mental health issues, officers may put in a referral through our mental health outreach mm -hmm. where we have social workers who are working with the police department and uh, police investigators and police uh, supervisors in order to do follow-ups uh, so that we can bring them in with uh, Alliance and other uh, mental health. Uh, our mental health outreach program, I think, is uh, one of the first that uh, this country's seen, and uh, it's just not been talked about a whole lot. Yeah. And, uh, but they continue to do extremely great work with minimal resources, and we're hoping to expand it. And we also have been enlightening a lot of other police departments throughout the country mm -hmm. relative to the importance of dealing with our uh, mentally challenged individuals in a law enforcement manner. Well, I appreciate your leadership on that. And, uh, again, I'd be, I'd be interested at some point in trying to understand kind of what the numbers are because 3,500 is a lot of people to encounter with a, with a, a lot of incidents with, to encounter someone with a mental health component. I know we have limited officers who have the CIT training. I know it would sound, it's, we, we trained 24 last year, it looked like, and I'm not sure what our total of frontline officer trained is, but I'd be interested in, in, in knowing a little bit more about that at some point. And I know that you do a lot of ride-alongs to the extent that I think you've already won a shirt or something. Yes, thank <laughs> and, you. Uh, so I, I, sure. I would say that maybe you might uh, take an interest in uh, and ride with the investigator that's working with our mental health outreach program so you that. can see firsthand the follow-ups that we do with individuals who are mentally challenged. That's great. I would love to do that. On the Hu Human Relations Commission recommendations, great progress on that. Congratulations on that. I know this has been a lot of heavy lifting on the part of the department. Um, uh, I'm glad you're continuing to pursue any ideas for an incentive program to have our officers live in Durham, and I'm really interested and in open to any ideas you might come up with that that, that we can afford. Uh, but uh, I hope that you all will think about what those are because that is a high priority. Um, how's it going so far with the written consent requirements for consent searches? How would you say that's mm -hmm. being received and how do, you, how do you feel like it's going? Uh, well, as far as being received, uh, the officers are doing what they know they have to do through the, uh, uh, the policies and procedures of this organization. And uh, I know that they're asking for consent. People are giving consent. Consent hasn't stopped because we're getting the signatures. Good. It may have slowed down, but it hasn't stopped. Mm -hmm. And uh, good. And they're moving forward. Hopefully, uh, once we roll out body cameras, that uh, we might be able to sit back and talk about the issue of uh, whether or not we need to get that signature. Uh, because by then, I think that I'm hopeful that, first of all, the trust in this organization has been reestablished, and also that uh, the citizens will see that <coughs> these encounters will be uh, recorded. Thank you, and, and congratulations on making good progress on the body cameras as well. Looks like you all are doing well with that, and I appreciate that answer about the consent searches. Chief, I wanted to just mention one thing, because as I reviewed these figures, it gave me a lot of thought about your budget request that we discussed last week, and so I just wanted to give you my perspective, and it's kind of preliminary, I know, but just something to think about. The crux of the case that you were making the other day is that violent crime, especially aggravated assaults, has gone up this year and that to turn that trend around we need more line officers on the street and then I step back and I look at that great chart that you've got uh, I look at the, that's you know let's just let's call it the Bill Bell era if we want to you know uh, or the or the Eugene Brown and Diane Katati era you know that we see that over that period of time and uh, the time that you've been here in previous the crime has gone down significantly uh, and if you took the chart back f a few more years, you would see the same. Uh, you know, this is uh, a national trend, but Durham has been, uh, especially in recent years, uh, continuing to drop when other cities have not to the same extent. So when I look at the bigger picture, here's what I see. I, I see a 15-year trend or more of crime going down. Uh, I, I calculate about 40% down since 2000. That's less than what you said. And even farther down if you take the chart farther back into time. And that drop in crime was accomplished with the same number or fewer officers on the street than we have now. So what I see now is with a one-year spike in violent crime, almost all of it driven by aggravated assault category, and property crime this year is 
and is the second lowest annual total ever, which congratulations. What I don't understand then is why that is an argument for more police officers. In other words, it seems to me hard to make the case that a one-year spike in what is essentially a single crime category requires more police officers when we didn't argue over the past 15 years that a steadily and rapidly dropping crime rate required fewer officers. So I don't think that logic works, and I think that's why we had four such different estimates uh, from Chief Burwell of the possible number of police officers we needed as presented in our budget set session. I mean, one, office, one estimate was we needed, one organization's formula, we needed zero. One, we needed 111, which is, would, would, you know, be 20 percent of our additional to our force. So I think that that's, that kind, that's, 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 there needs to be a different logic and a different case for increasing our number of frontline officers. And I said the other day that I thought there might be a prima facie logic that we have increased the number, the, the population of our city has increased so much, 26 percent, I believe, since 2000. But then I thought to myself, well, 95 percent of that population had increased, had occurred two years ago when we had the lowest crime rates ever. And so I don't really think that that is really a case either. But let me just tell you what I do think is more compelling, at least to me, and that is the potential for a, a policing that's a little different. Community policing, as you have said. Uh, where the officers get out of the cars, have time to interact with the community. That seems to me to be really important. And so with your budget request, I know what I'd like to hear is I'd like to understand specifically how that might be accomplished and what that might look like. Um, what I've noticed is that every police force around the country now says is doing community policing, but I know that looks different in different places. Some are, some aren't. But what are the best community police practices and what are the best departments around the country doing for community policing? That's what I'd like to hear in the budget request. And what does that mean specifically in Durham? And how would adding more officers allow us to do that better? How would allowing more officers allow us to do that better? That's what I'd like to know. And if I'm convinced about that, then I, and I understood the specifics very well, I'd be inclined to support the funding for this. Um, so those are just my thoughts. I wanted to offer them. I don't necessarily. You don't need to respond to them now, but as you as you as you continue through the budget process, I hope you'll keep some of that in mind. Thanks, Councilman Thank Michelle. Councilman Katani. I concur with most of that. Um, so, Chief, I just want to say thanks for the detailed report, and also um, appreciate the follow-up on the Human Relations Commission recommendations. It really is good to see that we've accomplished most of those, and we'll also look forward to hearing more about the impact of those. Um, I did had a question, uh, did have a question on the miscellaneous marijuana report data and either now or via email later, can you clarify what you mean by self-initiated and also what is flagged down? And that was on the drug self-initiated marijuana only arrests table. I, I can get you that. Great. Okay. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to comment at all on the non-sworn staff vacancies. It was 90 percent in the report. You just mentioned it's 94 percent, but it's considerably lower than your sworn officers, which I always thought that was our harder challenge to keep those positions filled. So, um, Yeah, we've been filling those positions. Uh, just this month we, we filled a couple of them. So they, they've been part of the process. They also have to go through a background. So uh, we may have hired you a month <coughs> or so ago going through a process then we have to wait till the background comes in and then to fit you into the uh, the position so do you expect to that percentage to increase we're, we're going to work towards it we're going to look to see if we can hire and uh, and fill those positions okay on a humorous note i wanted to compliment whoever came up with the name operation bah humbug I just, oh. <laughs> it's nice to have entertaining uh points in a police report um, sorry, I also want to, in a serious note, congratulate all the officers that were noted for going above and beyond and saving lives. Um, and I wanted to note a particular concern about the EMS response times. Again, that's county EMS, particularly after the comments at the last retreat. But I think um, that was highlighted in the report as well. Um, and uh, let's see. I had a similar question regarding failing the physical test and what pre-screening we can do to sort of help people get through that. 
And then lastly, I just wanted to note that um, at the last Project Safe Neighborhoods meeting, they noted that there was a challenge actually getting parental participation in the juvenile dis um, diversion program. So that's discouraging when a, um, a kid's being offered an alternative and you can't get the family to family. the table. So thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to ask Councilman Davis, Councilman Moffitt. In that order. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to ask the Chief uh, uh, about um, working with community groups. At a recent work session, there was an accusation uh, from a citizen group that they had had difficulty uh, meeting with you <coughs> or your staff. And I think when you all left, you had, sort of had a conference in the hall. So has that criticism um, evaporated, or are there... Well, would you say that, that folks are indeed uh, having access to you and your department? I stepped out with that, those individuals who said that they I had not returned their call. And the reason why I did not return their call is because they never called me. So uh, we did sit down with the group, and we have been in conversation with the group. We had already had a, uh, a meeting set up, scheduled. Uh, it was the second scheduled date. They were having a problem with the date, and we did sit down and have a very progressive uh, meeting with them relative to not only protests but other things in the city uh, we challenge each other and we're waiting for them to get back to us but as far as my not returning phone calls or having someone return phone calls for me that, that was not happening thank you mr mayor we're going to ask Councilman Moffitt. yes um so i have three things now um, i believe i read in one of the papers some comments by some of those people that met with you that seemed fairly positive in the newspaper they must be true then no, oh, okay. Well, I just, I, it was just about the, the experience of sitting down talking with you all. Right. I think there was an article relative to, uh, in the Herald Sun, sorry, Jim, who, uh, who spoke relative to that meeting and the outcome of the meeting. Right. There was an article. So, um, second thing is, um, I, you've talked a number of times about aggravated assaults and the number of incidents versus the number of victims. And it finally occurred to me tonight to say, why don't you report on the number of incidents as well, if you feel like that would tell a better story. Uh, the number of incidents? If you, if you have the data, oh. you know, just... You uh, the number of actual incidents rose 12%, while the number of victims was up by 23%. Okay. Because we had, we had quite a, a few shootings. So uh, that, did, uh, that did rise also. And then, uh, finally, I know that it's not in the fiscal year in which you just reported, or the calendar year in which you just reported, but the, um, there was an article a week ago uh, in the Durham News, so one to Jim, um, the, which was about the police, uh, the um, activity that, that uh, they did in District 1 with the Boys and Girls Club, which I just wanted to compliment the department on that. I know it's just emblematic of all of the kinds of work that you do, like what's on the screen, um, but, you know, to me it's about helping people under uh, helping our youth understand that police are not need to be they do not need to fear the police but it's also like to me long term like helping kids think about the police as a career down the road i think that's really important uh, changing the statistics on how many people in the force live in durham isn't going to be something we can do easily in a year or two years but long term thinking so uh, all in all, well done. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Well, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Chief. Good night. Good night. I was getting ready to recognize you, Victoria. You have two minutes on this item. I really would like to have. Three you have two minutes, um, Ms. Ms. Peterson, please. But the first thing I would just like to thank our officers um, for the support that you folks have, uh, have given our young people out in the community. So thank you very much. I want you to know that. I apologize for my glasses, but probably from now on you'll be seeing me wear them. Wear them, I have, um, um, I have some serious eye issues. But Mr. Mayor, I'm very concerned, and I probably could speak for, speak, uh, on this issue, and there are probably thousands of thousands of African Americans in this <coughs> community who probably feel the same way I do. We have some serious, some serious issues going on in this community with black folks being murdered. 
with African Americans being murdered in this community and with the crime that is going on in my community. I see a city council group here, and I'm not trying to beat up on anyone, but not one of you this evening has stated anything about the children that have been shot in this community over the last several weeks. We make national news because three people, three young folks are murdered. Even though they said Chapel Hill, which we all know that that incident really happened in Durham. But that's okay. It's terrible that three students lost their lives. But several days before that incident, we had two children in this community. One was shot and one was stabbed. And several days before then, we had, we had several persons that were murdered in the African American community. Nothing on CNN. Nothing, 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 nothing on CNN. Nothing coming here, hearing my city officials speak. Not one of you, not one of you have stated, well, what are we going to do about the black folks in this community that are being murdered? Not one thing. Ms. Peterson, thank you. And I, I'm not going to uh, have a discussion about this. I, 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 because you haven't been present doesn't mean the issues haven't been raised. Trust me. I know other persons have, Mr. Mayor. If you're I, on TV, you can watch it live. So, so uh, I, I, I appreciate you having an opportunity to come speak, but I just want to let you know that I'm not the only one that's concerned about this. I've spoken many times about black on black crimes in this community. I, 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 I've, I've spoken many times about black on black crimes in this community. But we had two kids that and, were stabbed. And, and, and Ms. 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 Peterson, well, you aren't with me. You know, I, I, you aren't with me 24 that's 7. Your knees. I know. All right, well, except, well, except, except, except that, that I take it very seriously as all the other members of this council, as does the administration. All right, thank you. I said myself and members of this council take this very seriously. All right. Just, just like you speak, just like you say you speak for thousands of black people. As mayor of the city, the mayor of this council, everybody on this council takes this seriously. But publicly, we haven't heard, we haven't heard anyone uh, say anything publicly. Uh, again, Ms. Peterson, you know, you, you hear what you want, you hear what you want to hear, and you go where you want to go. I respect you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just voicing my concern. That well, that's, 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 that's. That's your privilege, and I allowed you to do that. Yes, thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. We're going to move to the next item. Uh, which is a public hearing matter. Consolidated I'm, I'm 11. Consolidated annexation, Hendricks South Point Phase 2. This is <coughs> a public hearing matter. So Good evening. I'm Scott Whiteman with the uh, City County Planning Department. Before I begin, let me certify for the record that all notifications for these items have been provided as required by law. This is four separate actions by City Council related to the annexation of the Hendrick South Point Phase 2 development. First is a utility extension agreement to allow the applicant to serve the development with City Water and Sewer Service. Second, case BDG 1401 is a voluntary petition for contiguous annexation submitted by the property owners for the site. The Budget Management Services Department has performed a fiscal impact analysis based on the most intense use permitted by the requested initial zoning, and the analysis projects that the estimated revenues will exceed expenditures immediately upon annexation. Third, pursuant to state law, City Council is required to apply an initial zoning to newly annexed property. Case Z1402 is the requested initial zoning of commercial general with a development plan for the site. It, this, would, this zoning would allow up to 150,000 square feet of non-residential development. 
The development plan includes several commitments that are above and beyond ordinance requirements, including a wall, berm, and additional landscaping on the western property line, Restric restrictions on lighting, construction, and loudspeakers, and uh, construction of all the traffic improvements required by the traffic impact analysis. Fourth, the council must adopt a consistency statement as required by NCGS 160A383. The staff recommends that the council approve the extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning for the Hendrick South Point Phase II development. And on January 13th, 2015, the Planning Commission recommended by a vote of 12 to 0 approval of the initial zoning. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Again, this is a public hearing. Let me ask, the public hearing is open. Let me ask first all the questions by members of the council. If not, uh, we have one person that signed up to speak for this item, uh, Lewis Cheek. Let me ask, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item, either for or against? This being a public hearing. If not, uh, Mr. Cheek, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Bell, and members of council. My name is Louis Cheek. I represent Hendrick Automotive Group in this matter. <clears throat> this is phase two of the auto park development in the old Kennington Heights neighborhood. Phase one was zoned commercial about a year ago. Hendrick was requested by the council to close on all phase two properties at that time, and that has been done. Um, we have worked closely with the Abram Drive neighborhood to ensure that the auto park will not be intrusive in the phase two aspect of it. The first six text amendments on the development plan resulted from that collaboration. You've received a letter from Steve Bacchino attesting to the cooperative spirit of the discussions. We believe that we have a high quality development that Durham will be proud of. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval and we ask for your support. Thank you. I'll be glad to address any questions the council may have. Are there any other persons that want to speak on this item? This has been a public hearing. If not, I'm going to close the public hearing as a matter of fact before the council. I reckon this council. Thank you, Mr. I, I support this, but I, I do have a couple of questions for staff. Um, the first is, what is a street impact fee credit and why how does an applicant or why does this applicant have such a credit i think i may refer that to bill judge in our transportation department and then sort of going along with that would be why are there are no impact fees for parks or open space yeah bill judge with transportation um can you repeat the second part of that question then? uh yeah maybe this would not be for you okay. mr judge but which would be why the first would be what is the street impact fee credit why does this applicant have a, this credit yeah. and then the second part would be why are there no impact fees for parks or open space okay um yeah so far as the street impact fee credits the um the developer is required to um make their we have our street impact fee ordinance based on it's based on square footage for retail a certain amount and uh for improvements that the developer has made that are above and beyond basically turn lanes in and out of the site that provide additional capacity to the roadway network they get credit for those in this project that included uh, widening Fayetteville provide an additional southbound lane for the frontage of the site um, so they've received credit for those for those improvements that they can then apply towards those impact fees got so it. they likely won't end up paying any impact fees I see. related so, to streets I got it so that has to do with then I was saying it had something to do with they, that they a credit they previously had they're getting the credits because of the work they're doing on the streets on this phase of the development uh, well a lot of it was related to phase one but they're also making additional improvements okay. with phase two I see okay uh, so Thank they are paying impact fees. They're just so paying them in a, paying different, them in a different way. A different way, Got exactly. Um, Got I'll refer to the, uh, someone else on the parks. Thank you. Council Member Shule, the, uh, because there's no residential development proposed, there's no parks impact fees. That's I see. All. Thank you. And my second and last question is, uh, on page 10 it says that improvements may be required of this development. Under what circumstances would they be required? Is that referring to the... Uh, Traffic improvements. I have to. F I took these notes a few days ago, and I'll be doggone if I can remember. Let's see. Um, oh, 
Yeah, the, 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 this is the phrasing. The following improvements are required of other developments and may also be required of this development. Thank you, John. That refers to road. Yes. Those are improvements that are also required of the um, NC-751 South development. Okay. So in their traffic impact analysis, they assume traffic from both developments. But if this developer, um, as they're currently progressing, moves forward and they can show that the improvements aren't needed to provide an acceptable level of service right. with their development, they would not be. But I see. it just depends on the timing. It's likely that they're not going to have to make some of them based on their current rate of development. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask, are there other questions, comments? If not, I'm, I, I'm I just sorry. wanted to comment that the list of proffered committed elements, the, the, the additional committed elements that we saw, I thought, um, spoke well of their willingness to work with their neighbors. And at the, if, if we've reached that time, I'll make a motion. And if not, then I'd be happy to make a motion at the appropriate time. Uh, are there other questions? If not, I uh, declare the public hearing to be closed. The matter is back before the council. Uh, there are two motions required for this. Uh, first motion has three subcomponents: uh, extension agreement, voluntary annexation petition, and zoning map change. So entertain a motion on that item. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Any questions? Hearing none. Call the question. All in favor of the motion. Indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. The motion passes unanimously. A uh, second motion requires adopting a consistency statement. It's required by GS 106A-383. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Any questions? Hearing none. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, we move to item 26, which is a public hearing on FY 2015-2016 fiscal year budget and capital improvement plan. Good evening. Bertha Johnson, Budget and Management Services. Yes, this is a public hearing on the fiscal year 2015-16 budget and the fiscal year 2016-21 capital improvement plan. The city manager will present his budget on May 18th and there will be a hearing on that budget on June 1st. I'm happy to answer any questions. We have, if there aren't any questions by members of the council, we have one person that's signed <coughs> to speak on this item. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Hopkins, is Stephen, Stephen around? Yeah, I'm here. All right, come to the podium. I can't uh, you have three minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. My name is Stephen Hopkins. I live at uh, 654 North Hardy Street, Apartment B. And I just want to remind the council of its uh, continued support of Northeast Central Durham. And then I want to remind you that in order to attack homelessness, we have to attack it from all aspects. So that means whatever we do here in Durham, if we are seriously trying to fight homelessness in Durham, we need to include it in everything that we do. So, thank you. You're welcome. Again, this is a public hearing. Is anyone else who wants to speak on this item? Ms. Peterson, you have three minutes. I've asked, um, I think last year, and year before last, that the city over the next several years to set aside about $5 million to work with our young folks in this community. There is no way that we're going to take a serious bite out of crime unless we get a handle on these young men and women who are involved with criminal activity. I heard the police chief said that the crime is going down. And I've shared with you, he's only talking about the part one crime. You still have the part two. You still have violent crime going on in this community. One of the ways is to try to help these young men, these young men and women to get some job skills, partner with these companies that we're throwing a whole lot of monies. They're doing business here. I was over at, at a facility today, and I'm not trying to say anything wrong, did not see not one young, young African-American male at that facility. And we're putting millions of dollars at this facility every year they get monies. I didn't see not one young, young African-American male working over there on that property. And Mr. Mayor and city council members and those who are working on the budget, I'm going to ask again 
to set some monies aside, bring some individuals in this community who have some understanding of economic development, of economic development for the African American community, to have some understanding of putting young black men to work in this community, instead of keep building jails and courthouses. If this community, uh, Mr. Barnfield, and you're the city manager, you've got to help take the charge. You've got to take the bull by the horn in this community. Many of us are tired turning on the news, seeing all these young boys constantly in trouble with the law. It grieves my spirit. And many of us have been out here for years trying to work and help with these kids. But our hands are also tied. We don't have the monies. You guys do. We're not asking for any monies. We're just saying, you guys, if you want to develop the programs, develop the programs and run the programs. You have a beautiful building, Mr. Mayor, and the City Council approved the Holton Resource Center. That building should be packed with various resource programs. Carpentry, fiber optic, telecommunications, some various fields of even the medical field that these young men and women can go into. You don't have to have a PhD to be a nurse's assistant. You don't have to have a PhD to have an x-ray technology to do x-rays in the hospital. You don't have to have those kinds of big skills. Thank you, but Ms. we Ms. need to do something in this community. And thank you, Mr. Mayor Quite and welcome. City Council members. Quite welcome. Anyone else that wants to speak on this item? This has been a public hearing on the budget, proposed budget and CIP. Just for the record, state your name and address, and you have three minutes. My name is Larissa Seibel, 2410 Par Place in Durham. I just want to speak very briefly to say that the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit looks forward to working with you all and with the uh, manager and planners and community development and neighborhood improvement services and other groups on ensuring that we've got the, the funds for staff and uh, other resources to make sure that we plan for affordable housing around transit, that we reserve the land, and also that we have the funds to assist people who will need funds in order to, that all of Durham, people of all incomes, will be able to live near transit, be able to get to work, to school, to hospitals, and other places that they need to go. It's a great opportunity with the investment that our community is making in transit to also make sure we make a great investment in the people so they can take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you very much. Quite welcome. Tevin Armstrong, come on down. You, you have three minutes. My name is Tevin Armstrong, uh, City Council Mayor. How y'all doing? Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, kind of what I always say about the youth. Um, I volunteer at this D3 Community Center. It was called D3 Community Outreach. And the, the owner is desperately working to get funded. And I know this isn't about, you know, getting funded right now. But um, the budget, maybe if y'all could, like, I don't know, slide a little something to the side for the, you know, for, for the youth. Because the community, the communities are, we're desperately trying to revive, well not revive, but, you know, try to curb the youth towards the right direction. And I can just see them slipping away. Like, and they're, they're looking at the, you know, the people in the neighborhoods and they're, they're following the wrong influences. So um, I, I seriously think it's, it's imperative for the generation coming up behind me that they got the right direction so they can come they can grow up and do the right things and not just fall into the jails and the courthouses and stuff like that and just be and this is dragged through the system for the rest of their lives because then y'all ain't gonna have nobody take care of y'all <laughs> ain't gonna have nobody take care of us you know so you know it's said um it's a fight but uh, I, I think it's very important that we have some money for these youth groups so they can get some help and and they can be guided the right way. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Mayor. Mayor. 
recognize Councilman Shule. I just want to say, Tevin, it's good to see you not on your crutches. I guess that means you had some successful surgery, and that's congratulations. I think we're all happy to see that. <laughs> Anyone else? It's been a public hearing. If not, I'm going to close the pub public hearing and entertain a motion to accept the comments to the part of the record. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Before we do, I, I want to, I, if you just, just, to indulge me for a moment, I want to take a moment and just thank everybody for um, for coming, the people who spoke. Um, I do um, uh, want to, we, we've had a conversation, there's two things I want to say real quick. We've had a conversation about part two crime in the past. It's in the report, if you read the report, um, you'll see that uh, part two crime is down this year over last year, which was down over the year before. So I just want to like put into the record the actual numbers. Um, in 2012, there were 8,993 Part 2 crimes. In 2013, that was down uh, over 500, and then this year it's down slightly, so we're trending down. The second thing is I just want to correct something that was said earlier. Um, where Ms. Peterson is correct is that um, the horrific crimes that happened in Chapel Hill did occur in Durham County, just over the county line. But the media does have it right. They were in the city, of, in the town of Chapel Hill. Um, it doesn't really matter where they happened. Um, she's also right. It doesn't matter um, whether, um, how much press a crime gets, they all matter. They all matter to all of us, and I know they do. But I did want to correct that. Okay, any further comments, questions? Not entertain a motion to accept the comments as part of the public hearing and CIP, proposed CIP. So moved. Moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. We move back to those items that have been pulled on the consent agenda. And Ms. Peterson, it looks like you have all the pulled items, so I'm gonna invite you up. Uh, let's deal with item seven first, followed by are you there? Seven, followed by 14, followed by 15. And that's a uh, short Just, 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 just oh. a minute. Just a minute. And uh, since we have some time here, Ms. Peterson, you have three minutes this time. And Thank item you, seven Mr. is Frontier Telephone Settlement. Yes, and that's what I wanted to ask Mr. Baker. Um, uh, this is basically, Mr. Baker, some a settlement that the city seems to owe Oh, Frontier, can you share a little bit about that, it's about the 300 some thousand? Well, I, and I'm not sure if there's anyone from the administration yes, that wants Jim to. Super, super. Okay. Jim, if you want to speak to that, and then I'll, to, to the extent that you don't distinguish between a typical settlement and, a, and what we're doing here, I'll sure. jump in. <coughs> Jim Sukup, Emergency <coughs> Communications Director. What this is, was it, is a negotiation based on uh, interpretations of tariffs and what we would owe for 911 fees as opposed to uh, our current provider with Entrato uh, being a next generation system and we were on the cutting edge of going to such a system. Uh, it's not clear cut as to who owes what to whom and this has been a negotiation that's been going on for five years and they wanted considerably more amounts than what we agreed to settle for. So it's all part of surcharge funds and does not affect the general fund at all or any of our taxes. So. And Mr. Baker, I'd like to talk to you a little bit off record, offline about this, but I would like to say this publicly. I would like to just ask, then it sounds like that we are doing business or Frontier is doing business here in the city. Is that what the public should get an understanding of what is going on? They are licensed to do business in North Carolina and they are doing business in the city, yes. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask this city government to ask Frontier, get ready, how many of our local people that they have hired? And they've been in Durham for at least, what, two or three years now, maybe even a little longer, and I don't want to be wrong. I'm not, I don't know, Mr. Mayor, how long they've had a contract with us. but. This is where the rubber hits the road, people, and this is what the mayor's poverty program is really about. How are we gonna get our young people employed? And if this company, if Frontier, is doing business in this community, 
with tax dollars from these kids' parents and families and mine and yours. Let's try to ask some. And we're not trying to tell them who to hire. We just want to know, well, you've done some hiring. You've been doing some hiring. How many of our Durham citizens have you hired? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you're welcome. I'm entertain a motion on this. And so I moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, then keep it saying aye. Aye. And those opposed? Uh, Mr. Mayor, can you please ask Mr. Bonfield to get that information? I really would like to know. Well, you, you asked on the record, and I can okay. tell you off the record that uh, there are opportunities at Frontier. And in fact, I can tell you about one that you might be interested in, but okay. I'll talk to you off the record on that. Um, Ms. Peace, you might as well stay up there. You have okay. item 14, the police headquarters. I was looking here, and also I didn't get a, a chance to mention too, Mr. Mayor, but since I have a little time. Uh, you, you have three minutes on this item. Ms. Okay. Ms. Um, I, I missed my page, but I believe it was page eight. Yes, here it is, eight of eight. Uh, is this the company that you folks want to have them to do the contractor work, which they only have one African-American male working for them? Am I reading this right on page eight of eight? I don't know if that's the same page that you have. But anyway, I would like to know um, how many African Americans, and I distinguish between, between other minorities. I don't group all minorities together, okay? My ancestors and many people of color of African Americans in this country, we had over 200 some years of abuse in this country. And a lot of the programs that are put in place, even on the federal level, is because of discrimination against persons of color. And I know that this city has tried to do their best to make sure that companies are hiring people of color. But my concern now is because we have so many various persons of color uh, now in Durham, a diverse population. Uh, I want to make sure that, uh, uh, that African Americans uh, and, and particularly our men uh, are being employed in this community. So, Mr. Mayor, I would like to get some kind of report. Is this company here uh, to say right now about how many, uh, um, how many African Americans they have hired and um, how many they have worked with them now and how many do they plan to hire? And that's basically my same question on the other one also, Mr. Mayor. So if those two companies are here if there's somebody representing them. And Steve, this is where I could use your help out. You asked the police chief a lot of questions about crime. Now I need for you to step up to the plate and ask these companies how many men are they hiring from Durham, even if you don't want to use the word African American. Ask them how many Durham residents. Even, we even have and I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but we even have white males in this community who are struggling, who are trying to make ends meet with their families. But when you go out here on these construction companies and you see car plates from Texas, from California, from New York, and my state, New Jersey, wait a minute, what's going on here? So let's try to get some report, uh, Mr. Mayor and City Manager, of if we're going to be throwing out this kind of, these kind of dollars to these companies to come in and build and, des and design and, des and, um, and develop, I, I want to get some kind of report of how many of these young men uh, that they're playing, planning to hire. And the subcontractors, because many of you know that I do have a background in Ms. copper cable and fiber optic, you, as you, well you, as in construction. You, you raised some very valid questions. The information is here. Uh, we are ahead of ourselves to a certain extent because we have a disparity study that's coming up at our work session that I'm sure is going to garner quite a bit of discussion. So it is what it is unless the administration has some of the comments they want to make on what's on the report. So then right now on the report, it's only one black male that's working, that's working um, for this company? Actually, Lynn Lease uh, has their own internal workforce um, statistics there, but also they have engaged Callus Construction Company, a, a, a minority company, African American owned company, and they have committed 40% of the pre construction work to go to Callus Construction Company, which is a, a Durham company, 
and uh, the first phase of this, all we're committing to is the $215,000 for the pre-construction services right now. Then subsequently, once we achieve a guaranteed maximum price at the conclusion of design, um, then they will coordinate with the city's, uh, Lynn Lease will coordinate with the city's uh, economic and workforce development department in preparation of a workforce development plan that will serve as a plan for engagement with the city's workforce. So that plan will be developed and submitted for approval and execution prior to the issuance of guaranteed maximum price. So that will include, and I would say this, in the construction manager for risk <coughs> contracts that we have um, conducted over the past half a dozen years here in Durham, we have set these workforce development plans up and we have exceeded our participation in each and every one of these um, contracts. And so it's been a very good mechanism for us to to have construction manager at risk where we can go in and help go out to the market, pre-qualify companies and engage in them. So with regard to the architectural firm, I will say this, that O'Brien's Atkins um, um, architects and engineers, uh, they'd have, they do have uh, one African-American partner who's, who's here with us uh, this evening. And in addition to that, um, they are also committed to um, a, a development plan of their entire team, which uh, exceeds the amount of the percentage that was set up for the design contract. Well, I do know, Mr. Mayor, that the city does uh, use the word um, use the word minority very broad. But what what I want to make sure, and 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 I hear what you're saying. Uh, I want to make sure, and Mr. Bonfield, we need to make sure. Uh, I'm not sure now who is on your staff that uh, I know you used to have folks that kept up with that. Uh, Cora's not here tonight, so and I know she does too, but we need to make sure that uh, when we say minority, that's a very, very broad, that's very broad, and you, and you know that. That's very broad. We define so, it more specifically. Yes, I want to know how many African Americans companies as well as how many African-American young men in this community are getting jobs with these two projects that's coming down to two, Mr. Mayor. You're, you're, okay. quite, you're quite welcome. I, I would suggest, Ms. Peterson, maybe you want to come back to our work session on, well, you don't have to come. I'm just, I'm just offering because the disparity study is going to be presented at that time and a lot of questions. You, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can, I, I, I just want to comment that we don't have just a person working on this. We have an entire department that works on um, making sure that um, we get as much work to minority, African-American and other minorities, um, at owned women and minority owned businesses as much as possible. So I'll move the item, Mr. Mayor. Second. Second. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Most opposed, the motion passes unanimously. And Ms. Peterson, I thought you said you had the same question about 15, which is architect, contract for Brian Atkins, PA for the police headquarters complex. Uh, and I thought Joel had answered that, but. Am I reading this right? Is that, uh, is that $4 million? A little bit close to $5 million? Am I reading that right? I, I don't, don't know what you're reading from. Okay, all right, well, a number 15. I, am I reading that right? Okay. 4 yes. Okay, all right. So it seems that you folks have already put something, and I apologize, Mr. Mayor, I, I really wish that the work sessions were televised, because some of us can't get all down here to these meetings all the time. Some of us are trying to do some you other things You can't also. Ask, ask questions if you're on at the work session, even if it's I'm televised. Sorry. But I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I said you can't ask questions if you're on at the work it's session, even if it's televised. So it's streamed. You can listen yeah. to it online. Yeah. So you can, you can listen to it on your computer. It's streamed. The audio yeah. is streamed. Okay. Right. Okay. But anyway, I want to ask, what, um, what African-American company are you working with here? O'Brien Atkins. Okay. Are they? I'm they have one of their partners is African-American. Okay. He's been a senior partner in the firm who's been with the firm 20 plus years. Okay. And, and, so okay. And so, and, but these folks are actually going to do the building, right? They're going to help do the, they're the design. Architects. Okay, the design. Yes. Okay. So they, so they're getting close to $5 million and they have one African American employed subcontractor. They, is that what you're saying? That. They, hmm? they're, they're in the audience. I, I don't know. No, no, but is that what you're saying? Go Hmm? Okay. Sure it's more than just but anyway, Mr. Mayor, I will, I'm not here to beat up on anybody. You never are. Victoria. Hey, but I am here to empower, and, and <laughs> y'all may laugh. Okay, you you can laugh, but when but when 
black mothers in this community are losing their children because their boys don't have jobs, you folks start going to some of those funerals or you start talking to their children. This isn't a funny matter. It's not funny. There's nothing funny about this. What I'm trying to do, and many of my people cannot come here every night. They can't come out here on, on a Monday evening. And many of them do, but they watch and they see. And they see how I'm treated. And they tell me about it. Oh, Mrs. Peterson, we don't like how they make fun of you or how the mayor cuts you off. Our people are watching this. So I'm not here for a showboat. I'm here to try to empower my folk. So here's my question. The city has uh, brought in and trained young people in, 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 fiber, in copper cable and fiber optics. I'm hoping whoever you folks are working with, when it's time for that project, that you guys try to get some of these kids around here and some of the uh, black subcontractors. We have a lot of black subcontractors in this community who can do construction stuff. We need to make sure that they are brought to the table. And like I said, um, I know who's missing. Uh, Mayor, uh, Deborah Giles. Deborah Giles, is she here tonight? Well, she needs to be here so we can ask her questions because this is her. her. Has she been brought in on this, Mr. Mayor? She has? Okay, well, I really wish she was here tonight because she could sort of tell us how many African American Ms. companies Peterson, have been hired. Your three minutes is up and. I'm sorry? You're three minutes up and I'm cutting you off. Yeah, I'm, I know you're glad it's up too, Mr. Mayor. No, I'm I know not glad. you are. I'm not but glad. that's okay. But I appreciate it. But you understand what I'm, yes, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm talking about, as well as Mr. Bonfield and the other city council members. And, and if you want to share. I entertain a motion on this item. Well, can you share with second. minorities about how many African Americans are working it's for been the company? It's been properly moved and second. Any further want, questions? All in favor of the motion. Let me, let me finish the meeting, Ms. Peterson, please. Okay. I uh, carry the motion. All in favor of the motion, and kept it saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Um, is there anything else, else to come before the board at this time? If not, the meeting's adjourned at 8.28 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Cool as a cucumber. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>